Now, how well does that work for me? Well, I've published 10 products. Two of those have been hits, Eastern Front and Balance of Power. That is a success rate of 20%, 10 times greater <laughs> than the incremental strategy. Now, I grant there are a lot of ways you can quibble with this. I'll give you one quibble somebody gave when I ran this idea past me. He said, Chris, that's really unfair. I mean, after all, you're comparing yourself to the industry average. That's unfair because everybody knows that you're a talented guy. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How do you know I've got any talent? Do you have any hard evidence that I have any talent whatsoever? <laughs> the only evidence you have is my success rate. Don't hold that against me. Don't use it to, to you know, invalidate my results. What I'm saying is this is one of the things that I've been working at, and it seems to be one of the factors that's worked for me. Maybe it could work for you, too. So, so uh, this, the, uh, and especially, especially when we get this huge difference, if we were talking about 20% better, well, we could bury that in statistical uncertainty. But an order of magnitude? I mean, if I came to you and offered you a computer that was 10 times faster than the machine you were now using, I mean, would, you, would you be interested? So this, this grand leap strategy seems to be far more successful. But there's another problem here. This runs counter to the industry wisdom. I mean, everybody knows that grand leap, that's risky stuff, being creative. Boy, you can fail. That's, that's dangerous. Incremental creativity, that's safe and secure. And you're always, I mean, if you do Schneesland, you're guaranteed to sell 10, 20,000 units easily. You do a great job, you sell a lot more than that. So, so geez, uh, the industry wisdom doesn't support this. Wait a minute. What is the industry wisdom? Most of what people call industry wisdom is really publisher wisdom. And you are not a publisher. Let me give you the best example of this. I'd like to talk about a product called Chuck Yeager's Advanced Flight Trainer. Now here's a product that's uh, quite successful. I've never played it, which is why I picked it, so I, can, I can't accept the blame for the uh, uh, observations I'm about to make on it. But quite a number of people, well, I should say a number of people who are knowledgeable, whose opinions I respect, told me their assessments of the product, which is that it is a very competently executed flight simulator and it is utterly uncreative. That is, there is not a single new idea in that product. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that is, they took the best ideas of other existing flight simulators, they put, them to, they put them together very, very well, they came up with the hottest, sexiest, sanest flight simulator on the market. And then, that EA marketing mega machine swings into action. We're going to get ourselves the sexiest license we can. And they went out and they got Chuck Yeager. That's a license. And then they made themselves their Chuck Yeager stand-up posters with Chuck Yeager with his white helmet. And their Chuck Yeager, Chuck Yeager posters you stick on the wall. And the Chuck Yeager audio tapes. And the Chuck Yeager chopskis. And Chuck Yeager everything. And they marketed the big jabbers out of that product. And they sold zillions of them. It's fantastic. It was an immensely successful product. So here I am telling you, hey, you've got to be creative, and yet you've got a beautiful counterexample in Chuck Yeager's advanced uh, flight trader. Why do you need to be creative when you can get filthy rich? <laughs> <laughs> There's a catch. You are not a publisher. You don't control any of that marketing. It's not your decision to get Chuck Yeager. It's not your decision to turn that EA marketing mega machine loose on your product. You don't have any control over that. And yeah, yeah, if uh, Trip Hawkins comes fluttering down from heaven and says, <laughs> Here is 
is. You've got to take advantage of what you control. You've got to use the angles that you've got, and you don't have any control over those marketing issues. So they are utterly irrelevant to your considerations as a developer. They simply should not enter into your decision-making process. You've got to use your basis of competitive advantage, and your creativity is your best basis of competitive advantage. Go with that. So there's a very strong reason for you to push hard up into that grand leap creativity. So let's assume that you're sold. You're, you're sitting there saying, Hallelujah! I got religion! <laughs> Praise the Lord! I'm going to be creative! Good for you, brother. <laughs> How are you going to do it? How are you going to get creative? Well, geez. I can give you some rules of thumb here, some, some guidelines, but they're real <coughs> loose and sloppy. So let me give you what I can here. First, I'll give you a couple negative rules, some don'ts. First, don't. Do not be seduced by technology. That's putting the cart before the horse. Remember the root, the Greek root of the word technology very roughly translates as know-how. The how of doing something always comes second. I mean, if you want to accomplish something in this world, the first step is to decide what you want to accomplish. The second step is to decide how you're going to do it. This is basic common sense. And yet we see people who get seduced by the technology and they spend all their time figuring out all the neat things they could do if only they knew what they wanted to do. Examples, all the people who got excited over the Amiga. Great machine, really sexy, but should you learn the machine and then try to figure out what you want to do with it? That's kind of backwards. CD-ROM is a similar, te uh, similar example. Very sexy technology, very powerful, but if you don't know what you want to do first, you're wasting your time. We see the same thing with software technologies, fractals. A lot of people got real excited because fractals are so sexy. So they put together some fractal demo, and then they say, gosh, how can we turn this into a game? A, an even worse example, 3D graphics technology. So we see this all the time. Somebody comes up with a sexy way to do 3D graphics on a machine with hidden surface removal, and so many frames per second, so many polygons per second. They, do a, they, they get really excited over it, it's great technology, they get the technology working, and then at the last minute they say, how can we make this into a game? <laughs> this is idiocy. It's backwards. If you want to accomplish something, decide what you want to do, then decide how you're going to do it. Get your priorities straight. If you've got reverse priorities, that technological seduction will destroy the creative process. Another negative rule. Do not allow marketing, do not internalize marketing thinking. Do not allow marketing thinking to intrude on the creative process. This is, this is a mistake commonly made by developers who try really hard to get along with their publishers, trying to see things the way the publisher does, or trying to, trying to be a good businessman, so I'm going to think hard about the marketing side of all of this. And it is good to think about the marketing side, but we're talking about the creative issues right now. Now, the, the publishers, they rely exclusively on the marketing issues. They look at those focus group results, they look at the sales figures, they look at what's selling well. They rely very, very heavily on the marketing results, and that is as it should be because that's all they've got to work with, and it's not their job to be creative. It's your job to be creative. Marketing is fundamental. Marketing thinking is fundamentally inimical to creativity. There is a fun, it is fundamentally antithetical. Why? Well, the whole strategy of marketing thinking is we're going to take what we know about the past. We're going to take our sales figures, whatever focus group results. We're going to take what we know about what sold well yesterday, and we we're going to do that tomorrow. The basic idea then is we're going to, you know, if red games sold well yesterday, we're going to sell red games tomorrow. And if purple dinosaur games sold well yesterday, let's do a purple dinosaur. The fundamental notion here is similarity. Let's do the same thing tomorrow that sold well yesterday. The fundamental notion of creativity is dissimilarity. In other words, 
Marketing thinking is fundamentally antithetical to creative thinking. Now, I'm not saying that you should reject marketing thinking. Marketing thinking must go into consideration if you want to sell product. Marketing thinking is something you must compromise with, not something you must internalize. Don't allow it to intrude into your creative process. It is inimical to creativity. Okay, there's some negative rules. How about some positive ones here? And it's a little harder here. One suggestion. Live in the world of ideas. Ideas, see, creativity, when you create a new idea, you don't just pull an idea out of a black vacuum. All new ideas come from relationships and associations with other ideas. Ideas are the raw material of creativity. And so you want to stoke yourself up lots of ideas. You want to be thinking in, in terms of lots of different ways of thinking, lots of different ideas. You need to fill yourself up with all of those ideas. And this is a problem for people in our industry because too many people in our industry are too narrowly educated. They are primarily technical in orientation and they insist on remaining technical. There's nothing wrong with having a technical background. It's when you, when you put walls around yourself and you say, that's all I'm going to be. When you go home and the only books in your library are technical manuals. Uh, the, the very best designers, this is a very clear-cut relationship, the best designers that I know have, have enormous intellectual curiosity. Talk to Dan Button sometime about psychology. Uh, these people, nothing can stop them. They're, they're voracious. They're soaking up all the ideas they can. And that's one main source of their creativity. Ideas are the fodder of creation. So you need to expose yourself to lots of different ideas. How do you do this? One way. Talk to a lot of different people with very different points of view, not just technical people. You know, have you ever, have you ever had a conversation with Brenda Wall? She thinks different. She talks different. She keeps talking about this guy named Harry Stottle. I've never met Harry, but I'd sure like to someday, because he sounds like an interesting fellow. Uh, you know, she, and, and you have to work hard, and you have to think. You really have to, to work to keep up with Brenda, because she thinks so differently, and it's so illuminating. Brenda, you really ought to, uh, you know, start a consulting business where you go around and charge people $100 an hour to talk weird at them. <laughs> <laughs> so thought provoking. I thought she did so, that. And you need this. Techno you really need to encounter lots of different people with very different <coughs> points of view. That's one way to live in the world of ideas. Another way, read books, lots of books, books on different subjects. If all you're reading are science fiction paperbacks, you're in trouble. You've got to be reading books about, about history and genetics and physics and philosophy and <coughs> linguistics and, and sociology and psychology and military history and, and all the things that make this such a huge and fascinating world. You've got to immerse yourself in all of those ideas. You'll never, ever come close to, to scratching the surface, but, but you've got to make that effort because that is a major source of creative uh, power or something.